All right. Well, welcome everybody. Happy Friday one more time. Uh, let me get this sharing started. And this week we're going to be talking about a topic I know a lot of y'all have been eager to discuss, which is language revitalization, as well as funding for this kind of work. So we're going to go through the very, very basics of language revitalization as a concept and some of the methods people use. And we're going to talk a little bit about finding what limited money there is out there for this type of work. So just a reminder, this is actually our last formal session of the webinar. Hard to believe we're already at week eight. It has been really a pleasure to learn with all of you this year, and we hope to see you at future ELP events. But importantly, next week, we are going to be having a closing session with participant presentations, which means we get a chance to learn from all of y'all who have been here learning with us so far. So if you would be interested in giving a really short informal presentation about your language work, just take five minutes to tell us what you're working on in your community. We would love to learn from you. Uh, just email me if you are interested in presenting next week. And even if you don't want to present, you don't feel like you have anything to share just yet, come tune in and learn what people all over the world are doing with their languages. Also, if you are wondering about certificates, uh, yes, I will be sending out certificates next week by email. So if you came to seven of the eight live sessions, you automatically get a certificate. If you weren't able to join live, but you watched all the videos on YouTube, just email me to be added to the certificate list. And let's get right into language revitalization. So first off, really important chat. Uh, or sorry, a really important point to make that I am not a person who has engaged in revitalization of their own language. I am missing a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge uh, about what it is like to revitalize your own language. And I have not even worked that extensively in hands-on language revitalization projects. So I am just here to give a very introductory overview of language revitalization as a topic. There are some really great resources out there from learning from people who have more direct experience uh, working with their own languages, including the ELP language revitalization mentors. So I'll, I'll talk about that at the end, some other opportunities to learn from folks who have more firsthand knowledge, as well as some other learning resources that you can check out. But just in the broadest sense possible, what is language revitalization? If we expand it, it's just any effort to strengthen or promote or maintain or hold on to a language that is in some way at risk of language shift, right? If we break down the word itself, revitalizing, it's literally putting life back into something. Uh, and, you know, there are some problems with this term. Not everyone prefers it the most. We'll talk about terminology in a second. But in very general terms, language revitalization often involves creating new speakers, right? Teaching the language, learning the language, uh, increasing the amount that people are able to use it, both in terms of their language abilities and the spaces in their life where they can use the language. Uh, and this includes creating spaces in people's lives specifically for language use. Uh, in, in academic terms, we would say expanding the domains of use of a language. But this also means promoting rights or public support or awareness or community involvement with a language, right? So anything around creating speakers or usage or space for a language is part of language revitalization. But there are other terms out there you might have encountered. So terms like revival, reclamation, awakening, maintenance, all these are sort of related concepts. And just in very general terms, maintenance is more about stabilizing or keeping a language strong, right? It often can mean preventing language shift, preventing a decline in usage or speakers. So maintenance is really when things are at an okay level and you want to keep them there in general terms. 
Uh, and revival and awakening, they're used in different ways, but often they mean uh, bringing back a language that doesn't have any living speakers anymore, right? A language that is dormant, that is asleep, can be awakened, right, by, by helping people speak it again. And then reclamation is a little more complicated. It's a broader concept that sort of moves beyond the narrow traditional focus of language revitalization in just creating new speakers or other linguistically oriented outcomes and expands that concept to a broader reclaiming of not only language itself, but also ways of understanding language, ways of thinking, language ideologies, ways of knowing what a language is for and what it does. And reclamation is also often tied to a broader decolonization process, uh, asserting sovereignty and other types of rights, including language rights and language use. And so if you want to read about any of these terms, I've linked a really great paper here that sort of set forth a widely used definition of language reclamation by Wesley Leonard. But if we think about revitalization in a general sense, right? When I use the term revitalization today, I mean all of those things sort of wrapped up in a bundle, but we're focusing on revitalization in the, in the more canonical sense of helping people use a language more, right? And so some of the common goals when folks engage in revitalization would be helping people reconnect broadly to lots of things, including their language, their ways of understanding the world, uh, culture, their community, their ancestors, their lands, right? A lot of it is about rebuilding or nurturing connections that have been disrupted. Um, another really basic common goal would just be increase the number of people who can use a language, right? Create speakers or signers, uh, either folks who had no ability to use the language before, or maybe people who want to be more comfortable in the language. Um, this also includes increasing how much people use the language, right? Even if they already know the language really well, making space for them to use it more in their daily life. Uh, revitalization can also include gaining and enacting and defending language rights. That is the human right to use the language that you choose of your community. And this is indeed a right. It is included in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, and again, this sort of language rights framework can also include making it possible to use the language in more parts of life, including official parts of life. So having schooling in your language, uh, being able to use it in government proceedings or business settings. And then revitalization can also include things like visibility and awareness and sort of making the public aware that your language is there, that it is spoken. And this can include things like using the language to greet people in public. Even if folks don't know the language, they can use a greeting symbolically just to say like, hey, I know this language is here. Uh, this can include things like dual naming towns or locations or buildings. You see this increasingly in North America. Um, you will see street signs that maybe have an English name, but also an indigenous name. And uh, so there are a lot of other ways that revitalization is accomplished. But in the end, one of the big underlying goals is to improve people's well-being through language, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about how we get there. You may be thinking, oh, how does language actually make people healthier? But it does. And there has been a ton of research that demonstrates that. So it's not really just about being able to pronounce something or knowing the word for something. It's also really about, like I said, rebuilding and nurturing connections that have been disrupted, whether that's connections to other people or to land or to history or to ancestors. And that kind of reconnection has a really positive effect on people. And so there have been studies that show that language revitalization or language maintenance improve physical health, right? You see lower rates of diabetes, smoking tobacco, drug or alcohol abuse in communities that are revitalizing or reclaiming their languages. Uh, you see lower suicide rates, better overall mental health and well-being a greater sense of personal identity and belonging to a community when you have language revitalization. And even beyond just 
human well-being, you get these broader levels of societal well-being, uh, such as better economic opportunities, if there is language reclamation happening, better graduation rates uh, from secondary school, right? People have better educational outcomes when they are able to use and reclaim their languages. So it goes way beyond just words. And this is really what the language reclamation framework is about, is zooming out to acknowledge the ways language is interwoven with all parts of life and reclaiming that whole system, that whole system of ways of knowing and doing things. So is this really happening around the world? Is this all just a nice concept that's not actually going on? Because we know from week one that we're in a time of really profound disruption and threat to the world's languages, right? Around the world, there are more languages that are facing endangerment or threats than ever before in known human history. This is possibly the worst time for global language diversity that has ever been. But what's the good news? There has to be some good news, right? There is. The rates of language revitalization are also higher than ever and climbing. People don't just sit back and let this happen. People are taking action to stop language endangerment. And there's a wonderful study by one of our uh, ELP Governance Council members, Gabriela Perez Baez, and she and her colleagues did a big global study of language revitalization happening all over the world. Uh, and they surveyed 245 revitalization programs worldwide. And again, there are tons of revitalization programs that weren't included in this study and that have started just since 2019. So this is just a small snapshot uh, and ELP is actually continuing and expanding on this. So if you would like to share about your own revitalization work, I will put the link in the slides here and share those. But what this study found was that if we look at when all of these hundreds of revitalization programs began, about two thirds of them started after the year 2000. And so we see this huge growth basically every decade of the 1960s onwards, where we see more and more language revitalization each decade. And then things really exploded around the 2000s. And this study was conducted, I believe the survey ended in 2017, which means this is only seven years of the 2010s right here. This isn't even all of it. So if you see a little dip, that's just because this only represents like half the decade. And so what we're seeing is this really steep growth of language revitalization all over the world, which is really encouraging. So we might wanna know, okay, well, it's happening a lot. It's happening all over the world, but how exactly? How are people doing this? I'm sure a lot of y'all are interested in engaging in revitalization in your own communities. So what are the methods that are out there and which ones might fit your context? This is a really complicated question. This will just be a tiny overview again. But if we think generally, there are different scales that you can do revitalization on, right? So we have really big scale efforts and these would be programs within an entire community or an entire country to reverse language shift. And we see some really well-known examples like the national level uh, in the case of Hebrew or Israeli as some scholars call it because it's really different than ancient Hebrew where it was a language that was dormant. No one spoke it as their first language and now millions of people do. Uh, this is also like the Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic where there was a really, really steep decline after suppression of the language, but then huge scale efforts to reclaim and revitalize the language have produced thousands and thousands and thousands of new speakers. Also the incredible stories of Olelo Hawaii and Maori, where again, after decades of suppression, people decided they'd had enough and they reclaimed the language and over decades worked really hard from the grassroots level up to the institutional, all the way up to the government level, where now both Olelo Hawaii and Maori are official languages of their respective states or nations. So you can get there, right? It takes a lot of work and a lot of time, but you can go from really severe endangerment or even dormancy to 
widespread official status, right? It's it's hard to do, but it's possible. Uh, and it requires government support, which is hard to find in many places. It requires, you know, widespread public backing, but again, it can be done. And we are currently in the UN International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which is the UN recognizing the crucial importance of language revitalization. So this decade is probably a pretty good time to push governments to support language revitalization. But you might be thinking, okay, but I don't have an entire state or national government on my side. What can I do? Well, good news. You can also work on the small scale. Most good things start small and get bigger over time. And so you can do this as an individual, right? It, even if it feels quite lonely, you can do language revitalization all by yourself. But it really helps to have good folks around you. And this can start at the family level, right? Even if just your family commits to reclaiming and revitalizing your language in the home, you can do that. You can gather your friends, you can gather uh, a larger segment of your community, and you can start having small language gatherings at a community center or a school or your yard or whatever. And there are so many things that are achievable to do without a lot of funding or resources or official support, right? It is absolutely possible. So we'll talk about some of those specific methods today, because I assume None of y'all are entire governments. You are just people who want to do things on a small scale if you can. So one method that has just been wildly successful all over the world, you may have heard of, is the language nest model. And essentially, this is sort of a daycare or preschool or baby care environment for really, really small children, usually from birth up to about age five. And the key here is language immersion, which means it's it's a space that really only uses the language you're trying to revitalize rather than the colonial language or the dominant language or whatever. And essentially, the goal is for really small children to start their lives surrounded by the language, right? Some people have called these nests grandmother's house. Right, because it's, it's it's a space where you can go and the kids are safe and loved and talked to in their language, and if you know if you've ever been around a small child or a baby, you know they learn language so fast. Their brains are like little sponges that just absorb every bit of language you send their way, and so really the key to a language nest is to take advantage of this this time in a baby's life where they can just soak up language really fast. And so if a kid starts off being surrounded by their language, hearing it spoken to them in a safe and loving space, then by the time they're like five years old, boom, you have a native speaker of your language. Amazing. And this goes back to Aotearoa in the 1980s. So I believe in 1982, the language nests first began, the first one was opened. And three years after that, just three years later, there were 300 language nests. So this is something that can grow really quickly. And today there are more than 460 kohangareo or language nests. And there are 9,000 kids beginning their lives surrounded by Maori. And so this is a huge percentage of the population. This is 5% of all kids in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who start their lives off immersed in Maori language. And it didn't really start with government support, even though it has that now, right? There's an official Maori language week and there's uh, government bodies who only work on Maori language stuff. But in the beginning, it was just a small group of people who really cared about the language. And they made this happen over many years with a lot of work. So again, if you're thinking, ah, I don't have an entire government on my side, that's okay. Most of the huge things start small at the grassroots. And the cool thing about the language nest model is it's one of the examples of how sharing this knowledge and sharing the ideas between different communities can produce language revitalization at a large scale. And so in the 80s, 
uh, Dr. Larry Kimura and some of the other folks working in Hawaiian language issues were talking to Tamati Reedy, who is one of the founders of the Kohangareo in Aotearoa, right? They were just like, okay, what are we going to do for our languages? And the Maori folks said, we've been doing this thing called a language nest. You should try it. It really works. And like three months later, the first language nest opened in Hawaii. So in 1984, the first uh, Leo, the, the language nest, opened on Kauai. And now on all five of the main Hawaiian islands, there are language nests. There are 11 at least of them. And this was done not only without government support, but it was done when it was actually still illegal to have schooling in Hawaiian. So people really took a risk because they knew that this, this idea could really work to create a lot of speakers of Olelo Hawaii. And so even if you, you know, you're not really sure it's possible, just remember that the Language Nest program grew when it was illegal to do it. And now it is all over Hawaii. And there are thousands and thousands of kids who have grown up with Hawaiian as their first language because people took that chance. So what do you need? It's actually incredibly, well, I won't say it's easy, but it's incredibly doable to start a language nest. So really you need three main things. You need caregivers who know the language really well. And if you have elders who have the energy and patience for little kids, that's perfect, right? It's called grandma's house for a reason. Having elders present is often one of the best things you can do. And if you have some younger folks who know the language a bit, it's really nice to have them there as helpers because, you know, a bunch of little kids takes a lot of energy. So some younger adults to assist are great. And then really the core thing you also need is kids, really young kids, generally age zero to five, right? Old enough to, to be away from home for a little bit, but young enough that they still have that sponge brain for language. And it's, it's really important that their families also be committed to supporting their language learning, right? If a kid just goes to the language nest a few hours a day, but then comes home and doesn't have anyone to talk to, it's not quite as effective as if their family actually learns a bit of language as well to support the kids in their language learning. And then really all you need after that is just some place to have the language nest, uh, it can be somebody's house. I think the first language nest in Hawaii was just somebody's house or a room at a community center or just any place that is safe for kids to spend the day. And I think a lot of folks have access to these three things, right? Some speakers, some kids, and a place for them to hang out together. So it's really, really feasible. Um, and the reason that this is so successful is not only because little kids learn language so well, but also because it's something a small group of committed people can make happen. Uh, it doesn't take nearly as much as, say, implementing an entire school curriculum from kindergarten through college, but it can be a starting place for that. And so there are some resources here if you want to learn more about the Language Nest model, some really great stuff out there uh, for helping you begin one if you're interested. Uh, and then language nests are often also a stepping stone for immersion education. And technically they are a form of immersion education, but you know, when a kid is zero to five years old, they're not doing a lot of formal schooling. But once they get a little bit older, then you can start thinking about formal schooling or whatever type of education makes sense in your community in the language. And it can be partly in the language or entirely in the language. The goal is just to make sure the language is there for as much of the day as possible for kids. And if possible, teach most or all of the actual class materials in the language. And again, this does take a lot more resources than a language nest. This involves curriculum development and you know, getting whatever certifications are needed by your government. But Again, it is possible building up over time to get to this level. So, for example, in Hawaii today, 40 years ago, it was illegal to use Hawaiian in education. But today, a kid can go to school entirely in Olelo, Hawaii for their entire educational career from preschool 
all the way up to their PhD, right? You can do an entire doctoral program in Hawaiian. So again, it is possible with time and dedication to get all the way up to this level of full immersion education. So again, this is this is one great example in Honolulu. Uh, this is kindergarten, so about six years old, all the way through 12th grade, which in the US is the end of secondary school when you're 17 or 18 years old. And this is entirely in Hawaiian. And English comes in as sort of a secondary subject later on, but in general, most of school is in Hawaiian. Uh, and it also isn't just sort of American standard curriculum in Hawaiian. The curriculum is also built around Hawaiian cultural knowledge and traditional practices uh, that are integrated with academic subjects. You know, so you're learning math, but you're also learning how to farm in the Loi, right? All in Hawaiian. So this is a great thing to aspire to. But let's say you don't have the resources on hand currently to start an entire academic program through secondary school you can do revitalization programs with big impact with just two or three people. If you have someone who is really strong in the language, even if they aren't a trained teacher, even if they don't you know the, the theory of pedagogy of language, doesn't matter. A mentor apprentice program is another really strong, really localizable way to do language learning and language revitalization with very few resources. So a mentor apprentice program is essentially a partnership between a fluent speaker or someone who speaks the language really well. Uh, and often these are elders. And this is the, the mentor or the master. People call it both mentor apprentice and master apprentice. And then there is an adult. Sometimes this is the elder's grandchild or child or someone else that they know well. Sometimes it's just someone who wants to learn the language. And all you do really is spend a lot of time together doing things and just speaking the language, right? So you can start from zero where the, the apprentice knows none of the language and they just have to start out by learning, by doing, right? By pointing at stuff and asking the word for it or you know, the, the mentor describes what you're doing as you're doing it and you figure it out as you go. Uh, there are lots of really wonderful handbooks out there for how to begin your own mentor apprentice program, even if it's just you uh, and your, your mentor or your apprentice. But one other really big benefit of mentor apprentice programs is that it is a relationship building program too, right? It strengthens your connection with this person you're spending so much time with and learning so much more than language, right? You're, you're gaining uh, this really strong connection to their knowledge and their experience and just them as a person. So uh, in addition to being a really low resource revitalization method, right? It doesn't take much money or physical resources. It's also a really good way to connect deeply with somebody who is strong in your culture and language. And the history of it uh, goes back to the 1990s to California here in the US. Uh, the advocates for indigenous California language survival sort of developed this method over several years and published it in this book called How to Keep Your Language Alive, which is a great handbook for mentor apprentice work. Uh, I will also share a handbook from the First Peoples Cultural Council on mentor apprentice programs. So there are a lot of really great resources out there if you are interested in having a mentor apprentice program. So one example would be the Prairies to Woodlands Indigenous Language Revitalization Circle. Uh, Heather Souter, who is uh, one of the folks who runs it, actually was in these documentation webinars a few years back. Uh, and this mentor apprentice program uh, is, you know, it pairs fluent speakers with learners but they were really just getting off the ground right before COVID-19 hit. And that was a big challenge because spending time with elders in person became quite dangerous, right? You don't wanna get anybody sick. And so this is one of the many programs around the world that successfully adapted their mentor apprentice program to Zoom or other online programs. So you might be thinking, ah, oh, I really wanna do mentor apprentice, but all of my elders live really far away or I'm living way outside the community. What can I do? 
Well, the good news is it is possible to do this over Zoom. Like a lot of people would say it's harder, it's maybe not quite as effective or satisfying, but if there are circumstances where you can't be live in person together, you can do it online. Another really great example of something that you can do at the community level without massive support is activities where the language is used. A lot of the time these take the forms of weekend camps or summer camps, land-based activities, group activities, crafts. Um, there are all kinds of things that you can get people together to do, especially on the land, that build up language while also building those connections. Again, we keep coming back to connections and relationships, and that's because that's a really key part of language revitalization. And so if you get a bunch of people together to go fishing or to learn about medicinal plants or whatever, and you do it all in language, you're not just learning the language for these activities, you're also strengthening your relationships with the people around you, with your lands, with your culture and your knowledge of it. And all of these things help reinforce your language learning and keep it going. So one example of this that's, that's very dear to my heart is the IASA summer camp series in Iboje in Southern Cameroon. Uh, and this, it says a three-day camp in August 2022, but they actually held it again this year and expanded it to, I think, seven days. So this was a summer camp for kids from the IASA community. Uh, it's a pretty smallish language community, probably about 2,000 people speak IASA. And a lot of kids, uh, their parents might move to the city for work, or the kids might go to cities for school during the school year. But they often come home to the village over the summer, and they don't necessarily know much Yasa because they spend most of their time in a city where Yasa isn't spoken. And so this is one way that you can handle it if, let's say, people are scattered all over the place geographically, is set a time for everyone to come back to a relevant place and have a camp that's specifically about language and culture. And so for the Yasa camp, for example, uh, most of the activities are about coastal knowledge and ocean knowledge because IASA people are really awesome fishermen. Uh, and it's funded pretty much entirely within the community. And so there's a, an IASA publishing house and you know some community leaders who have largely funded this thing. Um, so it's possible to organize these camps without significant outside resources or funding, right? It's something a community can totally do on a shoestring budget. And there is a really great handbook, uh, the First Peoples Cultural Council's Culture Camps for Language Learning. Uh, it's an immersion handbook, and that is available in English, but also thanks to Akau, the intern who gave our presentation last week, it is also soon going to be available in Igbo and Spanish, uh, thanks to another of our interns, Nicaela. So we keep expanding this into other languages because it is such a useful model. And it's something that can be adapted to many different parts of the world pretty easily. So if you are really interested in language camps, but most folks in your community maybe don't know English, and you would like a translation, please reach out anytime to request a translation and we will put it on our to-do list. So these are just really a few of the ways that folks around the world have gone about language revitalization, but there are so many more. This is just a tiny sample. And so some of the other things that people do include family language programs, right? Take a pledge that as a family in the kitchen, we're only gonna use our language. Uh, there are song and poetry and literature competitions or festivals. Uh, you can make video games in your language. You can launch online learning courses if people are scattered all over the world and want to learn over the internet. Um, for silent speakers who maybe have trauma preventing them from using their language, but they know it, uh, there are some really amazing new sort of psychotherapeutic programs that were developed in Sami for Sami speakers and now are being adapted to First Nations communities in British Columbia and elsewhere. Again, all of these ideas tend to just circulate among communities around the world and grow that way. Uh, but even if it's just one person with a marker, 
you could make a sign that renames a street to its indigenous name and just put it up. I'm not encouraging graffiti or anything, but you can get really creative on what you can do. And it really helps to do some thinking ahead of time about what your goals are in the short term and the long term, what resources you have, and the opinions and preferences and desires of your broader community. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, that's really complicated. And it is. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how to plan out revitalization projects in a minute. But just if, if you're thinking, I want to do something, I don't know where to start. Here's just a really short list of things that you could just start doing today if you wanted to. So for example, if you know your language a little bit, you can make a domain in your everyday life where you decide you're only going to use your language there. So a lot of people do this in the kitchen. They decide the kitchen is a language only zone um, and you cook in your language and you eat in your language, whatever you want to make it, right? You could find a mentor who speaks your language really strongly, or if you do, you could become a mentor and just spend time with somebody who wants to learn. Uh, or again, you could learn by spending time with a mentor. Uh, this is something that you could begin working on right now if you wanted to. You could create a small group of people who do an activity every week or month, right? You could say, we're all going to get together and knit and talk once a month, whatever it is that folks would be interested in. And it doesn't even have to be traditional activities, right? You could be like, I am making a Minecraft server in my language, which is a thing. We just interviewed somebody who is running a Minecraft server in Sami. Um, you could do a project on some part of your culture you're really passionate about. You could make a, a little zine and publish it and get people thinking about, oh man, I should start cooking in my language, whatever it is. Just start getting other folks interested in revitalization. You could make social media content in your language. I think this is a really popular approach because you can do it by yourself on your phone or computer. Uh, and and I will again share these slides with a link, but last year we had a great session on making social media content in your language. Uh, you can make signs for your kitchen, right? If you've decided the kitchen is a, a place where you're gonna speak your language, you can also take them to your workplace or your school or your local library and see if folks would be okay with having signs that name objects or Share useful phrases in your language, just getting it out there and available to people. But this is, again, there are a million things that you can dive into. Uh, and it can be overwhelming to, to sort through all of your options, but it's also exciting to know that there are so many places you could start. But again, it's really hard to figure out where to start. Uh, it can be super overwhelming and you have to factor in so many different things. And that's why, luckily, uh, ELP's language revitalization mentors are available to offer guidance and support and just help you think through what your goals are for your language and how you might get there. So all of these folks are experts in different aspects of revitalization. All of them have really deep experience revitalizing their own languages. And so they're really wonderful people to talk to if you want to get started. You can make a free appointment anytime. I'll send out that link again. But excitingly, we will also be launching a new online learning series next year. Uh, Ready to Revitalize is an eight-week online course, kind of like this one, which will be taught by the revitalization mentors. And it's a more in-depth learning experience about concepts in revitalization, uh, methods that are used around the world and more deep info on how they work and really talking about a lot of practical issues like building community partnerships, finding funding, uh, mobilizing and organizing people for language revitalization and other sort of practical real world questions in how to do revitalization. And over those eight weeks with the guidance of the language revitalization mentors, all of the participants will develop a concrete strategic plan for a small revitalization project. Well, it doesn't have to be small, but it's a good place to start. 
unfortunately, there we only have room for 20 people in this first iteration of Ready to Revitalize. So we really encourage you to apply by December 15th. And the link is right here, and I'll, I'll put that in the chat at the end of the session as well. Uh, and excitingly, next summer, we will also be launching the Language Revitalization Help Desk. Uh, it's a learning center for people working in language revitalization. So this will include a whole lot of free learning resources about language revitalization from all over the world, uh, stories firsthand from folks revitalizing their languages in different parts of the world, uh, we'll also be having a calendar of events where you can check out revitalization activities near you or online, and a global directory of revitalization programs to show how much work is happening in this space all over the world, and to give folks this platform to highlight what they are doing and share their ideas and their work and their experiences with other people. And if you are currently working in language revitalization and you would like to include your program in the directory, please do. We welcome you. Uh, I will put a link to share that in the chat as well. So let's take a minute to talk about funding. This is a difficult thing to discuss because the answers are always unsatisfying. Generally speaking, there is way more money out there for language documentation than there is for language revitalization. And I, I just had a meeting with a funder uh, a couple of weeks ago where they were like, uh, sorry, as long as a project has revitalization as, a, as an outcome, we can't fund it. And you might hear this a lot, it's quite frustrating, but if you think a little bit back to week one and the origins of language documentation and, and why people do it, um, you may have some thoughts on why there's so much more money out there for documentation than revitalization. So if you have thoughts, put them in the chat. But let's look a little bit at some of the funding sources that are out there for documentation specifically, because there is funding to some degree. So the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, ELDP, actually people confuse ELP with ELDP sometimes. We're different. We don't have the money that ELDP does. Uh, but they are a great granting program uh, who fund language documentation in any country, so you don't have to live any specific place. They tend to fund documentation projects for more endangered languages, right? So paradoxically, this is a case where if your language is more endangered, you have better options for funding. Um, and they offer small grants up to 10,000 pounds UK for smaller projects. Uh, they also offer a lot of funding for PhD students who are doing big documentation projects uh, or postdocs who have just completed their PhDs. They also offer funding for sort of teams of researchers engaging in documentation. These are up to 150,000 pounds UK. Uh, one great option is is ELDP if you have some kind of academic affiliation. So one challenge with ELDP is if you don't have some type of university connection or academic credentials in documentation, it's really, really, really hard to get this funding. But if you are a PhD student or have a partner in an academic institution, this is a good option. Uh, the Firebird Foundation is less academically oriented, uh, although I think you have to be some type of anthropologist or linguist. However, it is open to students. Um, this is primarily for documenting oral literature in indigenous languages. So this is one section of language documentation that they do fund. Uh, and these are grants up to $10,000 US. Uh, and I don't remember what level of student you have to be at. I think master's students are eligible. You don't have to be a PhD student, but double check the grants. And let's see, revitalization funding is harder to come by. Uh, but this is something where you may have options at your local level. So I'm just going to talk about sort of the global funding sources today, but look into your state government, your national government, uh, your province, your town, whatever level of funding might exist for language revitalization in your area. Um, 
sometimes you'd be surprised you can get like your city council to fund a small revitalization program because you can tell them it's good for people who live in your city. So don't lose hope. I think we just heard from somebody in Cameroon who asked their town council to fund language classes and they did it. So start local if you can. You might be surprised by the availability of funding. But at a more global level, here are a few programs that do offer revitalization funding. Uh, number one, my, my best recommendation is probably the Endangered Language Fund. Uh, this is a great organization. I got a grant from them back in 2018 for an EASA youth workshop for language revitalization. Uh, and this was from the Language Legacies Program. So these are small grants, about $2,000 US uh, for documentation or revitalization projects anywhere in the world. You don't have to be an academic. Uh, you don't need any kind of university affiliation. It's a great option. Uh, and then if you are in the U.S., they have grants from the Native Voices Endowment. These are bigger grants, up to $10,000, for a specific list of tribes who came into contact with the Lewis and Clark expedition. I don't know how this funding condition came about, but th that's who's eligible for this program. Uh, and then if you are a Ph.D. student... Um, if you have some kind of academic affiliation, they have the Sharing Language Diversity Fellowship, which is up to $30,000 for PhD students doing language documentation, right? I think you can sneak in a little revitalization work to that, but I'm not positive. Uh, another organization globally is the Foundation for Endangered Languages. So this is a UK-based foundation. And these are actually grants specifically for language revitalization. Uh, I think as they put it is projects that will support, enable, or assist the use of one or more endangered languages. So these are grants up to $1,000 US and the applications are now open actually. They are due December 31st. So you have some time if you're interested in an FEL grant, uh, get that in in the next month or so. Uh, and finally, for specifically radio work or community media work, uh, Cultural Survival has a great program called the Indigenous Community Media Fund. And this is largely, I believe, for radio stations, but they also cover things like uh, local TV stations. I think they also cover digital media like podcasts. And these are grants up to about 5,000 US dollars plus training and support from cultural survival uh, from folks who have a ton of experience working in community media. So check those out if you're interested in media in your language. And then there's also the option of crowdfunding, which can be really challenging. Uh, it does rely on getting individuals to donate money. So you will have to put some time into publicizing and, and fundraising and all that. Uh, but this can be really good if you're doing a project that requires a smaller amount of money or you really want people in the community to feel invested in it and feel some share in, in the project that eventually comes about. Uh, this can also be great if you have friends or colleagues or social networks in a country that has a stronger currency. So let's say you're trying to start, a, I don't know, a language camp in Cameroon, just based on my own experience. And maybe you have a bunch of colleagues in France and the US. So one Euro or one US dollar can go a really long way in Cameroon. So send, asking people in other countries with strong currencies to donate a small amount for them, can actually fund a pretty big project in some places. So consider crowdfunding if you have networks like that. So these are really just a tiny sample of the ways that you could go about language revitalization and find funding for it. Uh, and I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts or ideas about language revitalization in your community. And again, really strongly encourage you to apply for Ready to Revitalize if you wanna dig deeper into these ideas and start developing a really thoughtful plan for revitalization in your community. So I'm gonna take a look at the questions in the chat. Let's see what we got here. Uh, I see a comment that, oh, somebody feels a surge of motivation and hope. That's really great to hear. That's, that's the goal of this session. All right, I see a question. So as a language teacher with the dynamic nature of language, it's also costly regardless of the attitudes of the speakers. Yeah. 
can language be revitalized as it is before without change? Oh, so this is this is a good question. So I, I think you're asking during the process of language revitalization, is a language likely to change from how it was before? And the answer is in most cases, yeah. In most cases, there is some change between a language as it was spoken a hundred years ago and a language as it's being revitalized today. But it's also worth keeping in mind, this is true of any language, right? This is true of the world's biggest languages. English today, uh, French today, Arabic today is not exactly the same as it was a hundred years ago. Uh, there are some changes that tend to happen in languages when they undergo endangerment and also when they are revitalized. So this type of language change can be a little different than, you know, what, what you see in larger, more vital languages. But there are ways of addressing this that embrace that type of change, that don't consider it a deficit, that just consider it something that happens and something a community can work with and take take claim over. Um, I, if you want to know more about sort of language change during the revitalization process, let me know and I will put some, some readings in the folder. Um, another question, could you please say something about language maintenance and language revitalization? Yeah, uh, I don't think I can capture the entire literature here, but Maintenance in very broad terms really refers to keeping things stable, right? Preventing language shift, preventing language loss. Uh, whereas language revitalization is more about reversing language shift, reversing language loss and bringing things upwards instead of keeping them stable. Uh, that's that's the, the simplest de definition I can give, I suppose. Uh, I see a request to link the book for Mentor Apprentice Program. So, yep, I will definitely drop that in the folder as well. Uh, let's see. I see. I'd love to hear more about how immersion worked during COVID and hearing people how these learn these languages over distance would be great for people who can't travel. Yes, there was a, a lovely article that we co-published with the Smithsonian's Folklife magazine about that specific mentor apprentice program on Zoom. So I will link that as well. Let's see, I uh, see another really interesting question. When should we start revitalization in order to be successful? I mean, can we really be successful in revitalizing a language 100% after extinction? Or when about 10 or 20 or 500 or 1,000 speakers remain, when is the best moment for successful revitalization? This is a great question, and I don't know if I can do justice to it in a short answer, but the short answer to when is the best moment for successful revitalization is now, as soon as possible, right now, right this second. Don't wait, just start. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing Daryl Robes Kip, who's a really amazing Blackfeet language activist. I think he said, don't, don't ever wait for permission to revitalize your language, just do it, start today. Um, it is harder. Um, the further along language shift is, it does get harder to do certain types of revitalization. Again, never impossible. But if you're starting with a thousand speakers, um, it, a lot of parts of revitalization are just easier than if you have 10 speakers. So don't wait. Don't wait for things to get more dire. Uh, don't, don't wait for everyone to be exactly on board with exactly the same methods. Just start that momentum going as soon as possible. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that if your language is already facing really significant challenges that you have no hope. Of course not. It just means it's always better. Early intervention is is generally more successful, whether it's in language revitalization or medical treatment or whatever. Um, let's see. Question: How can we benefit from this funding as PhD students? Yeah, I will. I will send around these slides that have the links to all of these grant programs, and you can take a look at their specific requirements. All right. I see a question. Could you share your opinion on the current classification of endangered languages? How accurately does the theory reflect the practical field work you've done? Oh, what a great question. Yeah. Uh, 
So first of all, any theory is never going to be a perfect reflection of reality, no matter what field you're in. But I think language endangerment theory uh, and the way that we classify language endangerment is especially prone to disconnection from reality just because it's a very young field. Uh, you know, people have been talking about language shift and language endangerment for a while, but it really didn't enter the mainstream of linguistics more than 30 years ago or so. And so a lot of the, the theoretical work on, on language endangerment is, is young and based on pretty limited examples. Um, this is a much a much longer answer, so I'm sorry if it's unsatisfactory, but uh, a lot of the ways that we talk about and classify endangered languages are really stuck in a very colonial, very Eurocentric, or I suppose Euro-American, Australian-centric way of, uh, of, of talking about and understanding language loss. Um, and I think it has been really insufficiently informed by non-Western understandings of language. So a lot of the theory doesn't apply in a lot of parts of the world and a lot of communities because it was developed with a really narrow view of how language works and, and what it is. Uh, yeah, essentially, I think that we are direly in need of a new way of looking at language vitality that has space for indigenous understandings of language and epistemologies. Uh, but that doesn't mean that our current classification of endangered languages is totally useless, just that it it's limited. It has limitations, but it can be useful for, for some things. I hope that is a halfway useful answer, but I'm happy to talk more about it uh, if you want to email me anytime. Um, let's see. I see some more requests for links. So as soon as I'm done answering these questions, I will drop those links in the chat. Let's see, since it's so expensive for me without the intervention of the government for a long time and the interest of the community, do you think that revitalization is possible by a PhD project or other small revitalization project? Great question. And this makes us ask the question, what is success in language revitalization, right? What do we consider successful revitalization? How do we define that? And that answer is going to be really different no matter who you ask, because in some cases people have huge goals. They're like, for me, success is every kid in our community speaks the language perfectly. And some people might say, for me, success is, you know, my mom and I can talk over dinner every week, right? So it really depends on your goal. Um, but if you ask in general, is revitalization successful in the context of a PhD project? I gotta say no, because a PhD project lasts, what, three to six years at most. Um, and it is constrained by the limitations of, of academic research, right? You have to do certain things to finish a PhD project. And those generally are more about academic research production than community work. And so I think short-term academically focused projects are really unlikely to make a big dent in the revitalization process. However, can they contribute? A hundred percent. Can they be useful? Totally. Can they spark something bigger? Definitely. Um, I think the key really in, in your question is without government intervention, but also without the interest of the community you specified and do I think revitalization is possible without the interest of the community? That's that's very hard to do because revitalization is a, is a process of community transformation. And if nobody wants to be part of that transformation, it's very unlikely to happen. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I see a question. I'm working as a PhD student on language revitalization, specifically family planning and language maintenance. Can I receive funding for such a project? Uh, yeah, it depends on the, the grant body you apply to. That sounds like something that the Endangered Language Fund would, would offer funding for. Uh, some of the others, I'm, I'm not sure, but worth checking out. Let's see. Uh, one more question. Is language revitalization something a person without a college education and who doesn't speak an endangered language possible? Sometimes it just feels daunting to think about. 
Yeah, so if you don't speak, then the next question would be, is it your community's language that you are interested in revitalizing? Um, if I'm reading this as, you know, is something, someone without formal training and who isn't a member of the relevant language community, is it possible? It is not possible for that person to revitalize a language. It's generally not possible for anyone outside of a community to revitalize a language. And I wouldn't encourage anyone to, to do it because it's not really our place. But is it possible to contribute? Absolutely. I think that's that's a quote I think of often from Dr. Jeanette Steven, who's a member of the Katazan and Dusun communities in Malaysia. She said, we need a lot more people in language revitalization, right? As long as you're willing to let indigenous communities be the lead and, and make the decisions and be in charge of the project, you can show up to assist. You can say, put me to work, right? Please let me assist if I can do anything. Um, so definitely, yes, you can contribute. And the ways you can do it depend on what programs you want to contribute to, what people want from you, where you can be useful. A really good place to start would just be getting in touch. If there is a, a local indigenous community who's doing language revitalization near you, just get in touch and be like, can I bring coffee and donuts to your next classes, right? Can I drive some books to be picked up from the printers, right? There's often just like really practical hands-on stuff that always needs assistance. So just ask. I think the best thing to do is ask and offer what skills you have that you think might be applicable. Um, trust me, most revitalization programs just have so many day-to-day -day tasks that somebody has to do and nobody has time to do. Like you need to collate all these papers and staple them, or you have to go pick this stuff up from the post office, or you know, can somebody please make pie for our next meeting? So just reach out and ask and offer some of your ideas for ways that you can be useful. And I would say maybe don't jump right into like, I'm going to be central to this language class. Just ask if you can bring coffee or something to start with, something practical. Um, let's see. I think that's all the questions in the chat I see for now, but I want to reiterate that I am probably not the best person you could learn about revitalization from because it's always so much more meaningful to learn from somebody who is working with their own community and their own language. And I am an outsider in every way. So I really encourage y'all to apply for Ready to Revitalize to learn from some much more knowledgeable folks. I am putting the application link in the chat now. Uh, and then I think we also had a request for the links to the Mentor Apprentice Program Handbook. Let me grab that now. And if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or just hop on video or audio and ask. And here is the Mentor Apprentice Program Handbook link. That one's the English version. Here is the Language Nest Handbook from FPCC. And here is the Language and Culture Camps Handbook. And these are all really excellent resources. And there are many more great revitalization resources from the First Peoples Cultural Council, which is one of ELP's founding partners. So we love their work and appreciate their resources a great deal. All right, well, I don't see any other questions and we are a little bit past time, but if anyone else has questions, please let me know. Uh, if anyone would like to talk over any of your ideas or thoughts or uh, yeah, if you want some help thinking through a revitalization process, please make an appointment with the mentors. I will drop that link in the chat as well. They are wonderful folks to talk to. And they have lots and lots of experience in different aspects of language revitalization. So reach out to them for sure. And it's it's always free, it's all free. Uh, and so it has been a wonderful time learning with y'all over the last eight weeks. And just a reminder, 
if you would like to share about your own language work, whether it's in documentation or revitalization, if you'd like to just give a, a short informal five minute presentation about your language work, please email me and we'll put you on the schedule for next week's presentation session. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, you'll also receive your certificates next week as well. So keep an eye out for those in your email. If you don't get them, just write to me. You may have put in the wrong email for your Zoom registration. And uh, in the meantime, I hope everybody has a lovely weekend and uh, have a, a safe, warm, happy uh, holiday if it's a holiday for you this week. So take care, everyone, and we will see you next week.